Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at this virtual BCMC social. So like Kathleen said, I was an active member of the BCMC from 2016 to 2019 when I lived in Vancouver. Uh, I gave a presentation about my adventures in the Canadian Rockies about two years ago at another social, and they liked me enough to ask me back again. So this time I'll be talking about uh, my mountain adventures around the world. So besides mountain sports, another passion of mine is world travel. I've visited over uh, about 40 countries on all seven continents. And most of these trips have been as a typical tourist, taking in the wonderful culture, history, architecture, and food of, of foreign countries. It's only been in recent years that I've traveled overseas for the purpose of mountain sports. So nevertheless, I did manage to squeeze in some kind of mountain activity in a lot of my travels. All right, so let's get started. So tonight I'll give you a whirlwind tour of uh, seven mounted adventures around the world, one on each continent. With the exception of the two rock climbing trips. Uh, hold on. Yeah, I'm going to stop my, well, then you can focus on the, the photos. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a whirlwind tour of seven mountain adventures around the world, one on each continent. So with the exception of the two rock climbing trips, the adventures are suitable for anyone with a decent fitness and some hiking experience. So there's nothing hardcore, nothing really technical, but beautiful scenery and great memories. So uh, please hold your questions until the end. You could en enter them in the chat uh, or just uh, ask at the end of the presentation. I'm just hearing something that the images are not full screen. Uh, what, what are you seeing? Like, so I'm seeing the full screen. Um, you know, I got a comment from Murray. Um, but you know what? That might be just his particular screen. Is that <laughs> anyone else having that issue? If you if you want to see the full screen, go to the top right corner where it says View, and then click Standard, and that'll get rid of the um, the list of um, attendees. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. Sorry for that. Hey, thanks, Wayne. Uh, hopefully, everyone can see uh, the photos in full screen now. Uh, so, first up is uh, closest to home rock climbing in El Potrillo, Chico, Mexico in 2016. So this was an ACC Calgary trip, uh, which is where I, I'm living now. Uh, so where North America is El Potrillo, Chico. There it is. Thanks, Google Maps. One of the good things about climbing in El Potrillo, Chico, which means uh, the little coral or EPC for short, is that you can walk to most of the crags from your guest house in about 30 minutes. It's all sport, all limestone, and a whole lot of vegetation on the rock. There's a popular multi pit climb called Space Boys. We met a bunch of Canadians, Americans, and Europeans around the campfire by the crags. I tether my camera so I don't lose it if it's dropped. We climbed a Estrellita, a 12 pitch 510 plus sport climb, or what I like to call Extra Lida, after the trip leader and mountain woman extraordinaire Lida. Here's the crux pitch. Uh, we start in the dark, that's why I have my headlamp on there. And here's Lita at the top of the climb. New to multi-pitch at the time, Reina learned to trust her personal anchor. Uh, now she climbs a harder sport than me. Uh, I'm leading pitch two, if you can see the red person there. <laughs> I'm leading pitch two of Aguacel Ray, which was probably the best climb I did. So our interaction with the locals was one of the reasons this trip is one of my favorites. 
Catalina really helped us out with this. Uh, fluent in Spanish and outgoing, she had no problem approaching locals. So one time we were, there's four of us wanting to hitch a ride from the village back to our guest house because it's like a 45 minute walk. So she's able to talk to the locals and a, a small car was willing to give us a lift home, but there was already four people inside the small car, but they were willing to fit four of us inside as well. So two of us went in the back. So four people in the back seats, two people in the front seats and two people in the trunk. That was, uh, that's Mexico. Then another time, uh, I think it's Raina and I were coming down in the dark from a multi-pitch climb, uh, which was uh, the base of the crag was at a picnic area. So we're, there were some locals having a barbecue and Catalina chatted them up. So when we came down, Ray and I were hungry and thirsty and uh, they, they shared our barbecue and food and beer with us. So the six of us got tricked by cactus at least once while climbing that week. Next up, let's go to Patagonia, Argentina for, for some glacier hiking in November 2008. Patagonia is a wild and spectacular region in South America, encompassed by Argentina and Chile. It's, uh, impressive icebergs under Ciro Torre. I did a guided holiday on ice hike on a dry glacier in the Ciro Torre area. Okay, here we are in Patagonia. Let's try that again. Okay, here we are in Patagonia, Argentina, November 14th, 2008. We're doing an up north excursion, holiday on ice, and the beginning is that we have to cross uh, Fitzroy River, uh, like that, just to get across the little river there. And here's a Torres Lake, Cyril Torres in the clouds, and Cyril Solo. Alright, so we all have to do this just across the river. Uh, so that was my first Tyrolean traverse. So we did not rope up on the dry glacier. Because uh, a dry glacier means it is free of snow, which uh, unlike our glaciers in uh, North America. So dry glacier means uh, the crevasses are obvious. And with the two guides, we did some alpine ice climbing on Seracs. Uh, those of you in uh, Vancouver, you might have had a chance to do some uh, Serac climbing on Mount Baker, which I did a couple times when I was out there. So you'll know what this, uh, what that's like. Here I am in an ice tunnel in the glacier and hiking by Fitzroy. So those of you that are into mountaineering and or have seen uh, those uh, adventure films, Cyril Torrey and Fitzroy are pretty famous for uh, big wall alpine rock climbing, uh, way above my level. Uh, this is Perito Moreno. Not, it's not the glacier I hiked on, but it's the largest glacier I've ever seen. Uh, I wish I would have taken this picture with something to give it a scale, but it's uh, 30 kilometers long, five kilometers wide, and 170 meters high. Massive. Uh, continuing south for some easy mountaineering on the Antarctica Peninsula in uh, November 2008. So Antarctica was the seventh and last continent uh, I've visited. We would eat, sleep, learn, and sail around the peninsula on a ship uh, of about 100 people in the background there, and taking half day trips to land on motorized zodiac rafts. 
we saw several different types of penguins, including Gentoo and Chinstrap, and the king penguin here. Here we go. Here we go. Come on, slide faster. Yeah, it's a three-way race. Go, go, go. Go, go. And the winner is Gentoo penguin number two. Uh, we could sign up and pay extra for uh, three different programs, mountaineering, skiing, and kayaking. So I chose mountaineering. It was really amazing to go from the ocean to the top of a snow-covered mountain within hours by foot. Uh, our two guides were from New Zealand. The penguins were everywhere. Uh, icebergs were spectacular and unique, like snowflakes. Mountains rise straight out of the sea. The kayakers were the closest to the water. Us mountaineers got to try some alpine ice climbing in Antarctica. So, <laughs> I think uh, this picture confirms my memory with that um, the guides didn't place any ice screws during the climb, only for the anchor. And at that point, I was not ice climbing, so I didn't realize how sort of unsafe that is. So those of you that ice climb, I highly recommend that you should place ice screws before you build an anchor. Okay. Um, so the mountain climbs were generally snow slogs, open to beginners. Though we did rope up for one of them. Feeling cold yet? Let's warm up by heading over to Africa. I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in 2006, September 2006. So Mount Kilimanjaro is in Tanzania halfway down Africa on the east coast. We did a guided seven day, six night Machami route, also known as the Whiskey Route. Uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, or Kili for short, is in the background. The 62 kilometer hike starts within Kilimanjaro's lush, fertile montane rainforest. We slept in tents and moved camp every day, but only had to carry our day packs. The porters carried all the food, group, camp, and overnight gear. Um, if you look closely, this porter here is carrying what looks to be like a tent and a duffel bag on top of his head. This is the lava tower camp. Uh, it's getting rocky. And we had to wait a bit at this bottleneck in the trail where there was uh, some easy scrambling. And now as we get closer to the summit, it's getting cold. Welcome to the highest point in Africa, one of the seven summits, the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro at 5,895 meters. Okay, here we are on the roof of Africa, Uhuru Peak, 5895 meters, Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, sunrise. We just climbed through the night for about 6-7 hours to get to the summit. There's the sun just rose above the sea of clouds. It's a, a Sunday morning, uh, September 17th, 2006. There are my... One of my comrades, Florence, from France. And my guides, Prosper. Way Prosper. Super duper! Yeah, and assistant guide, Arsen. There's a great one of many glaciers. 
All right. And there's my other, my fellow hiker and friend and colleague, Mustafa, videotaped me as well. All right. So that's the roof of Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro, 5895 meters. World's largest volcano and tallest freestanding mountain, highest point in Africa. Can you take a picture? This is the retreating Fort Wangler Glacier near the summit. So the highest of the seven summits is Mount Everest, of course, uh, to whose uh, Tibetan Advanced Base Camp, ABC, I had the pleasure of trekking in September 2004. This is the north face of Mount Everest from Rongbuk Camp at 4,900 meters, where we started our and ended our eight-day, seven-night trek. So Mount Everest is located on the border of Tibet, China, and Nepal in Asia. Starting from Rongbuk Camp, we gained about 300 meters of elevation each day over 10 to 20 kilometers of trekking uh, during the ascent. Mount Como Langma is the Tibetan name for Mount Everest. It was my first time at high altitude and my first time having a headache that lasted more than a few hours. The guided trek had us tourists hiking with just our day packs. While the Sherpas and Yaks carried all other gear, food, and waste barrels. So the term Sherpa refers to a Tibetan ethnic group of people who live in the Himalayas and should not be used for other mountain porters. Here's a, a, our typical camp. The first few days of trekking had us tourists leaving camp and arriving at the next camp before the Sherpas. But as the effects of altitude sickness increased with elevation, they beat us to the next camp, even though they left after. Is someone drawing on the screen somehow? Hold on. Uh, anyone know how to get rid of those yellow lines? No, I've never done those yellow lines. Um, you need to clear the annotation. So one second, let me see. Chris, can you, from the main menu at the top, go to annotate? Uh, Zoom. It's under edit gum and Mac. Um, oh. Yeah, not seeing one. Um, view options. Yeah, view options, annotate. Uh, here I annotate. And then do you have a under clear? Do you have like a clear all or something? Clear all drawings. Yeah, I'll try that. Right there, that worked. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you, Chris. No problem. Okay, okay let's uh, resume. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, some yaks uh, did not make it. Um, this was my first time seeing Seracs. This is uh, 2004. And it, it was an awesome experience walking between them. So we did not camp at Everest Advanced Base Camp, shown here at 6,425 meters the highest I've ever been. Uh, our smiles hide how out of breath we were. It, it took us six days to trek from Rongbuk to advanced base camp, two of those being rest days. But it took us only two days to return. Uh, acclimatization is a lot faster going down than up. And here's the sunset on the north face of Mount Everest. So we've hiked and we've tracked, but have we tramped? 
That's what, <clears throat> that's what New Zealanders call backpacking or hiking, which is what I did in October 2003. New Zealand is part of Oceania, which includes Australia, which is sometimes called a continent as well as a country. We did short hikes almost every day during our tour of South Island. We did a three day, two night tramping trip around the Nelson Lakes district. So not only were these photos taken before Facebook, but before I went to digital cameras. The trip involved creek crossings and a river crossing where we linked arms resulting in a, a short woman not touching the ground at this point. See if you can pick it up. Uh, we kept our eyes open for Kiwis, but never got a photo of one. I did snap a photo of this bird called a Kia, K-E-A, who is probably the culprit that made holes through my tent, through my backpack, and through a Ziploc bag to eat my trail mix while I slept. This is Peter's pool during our tramp to see Franz Joseph Glacier. Sunset on a beach in Punakaki. I'm doing a canyon swing in Queenstown, self-proclaimed adventure capital of the world. That just leaves us with uh, Europe. Circle back to my favorite mountain sport, rock climbing which is why I went to Kalimnos, Greece, in November 2018. Okay, Google, where is Kalimnos? It's an island close to Turkey, closer to Turkey than mainland Greece. Our first day of climbing, we had, we had to get used to the limestone rock and the French grading system. Uh, coincidentally, our first day of climbing in Kalimnos at this crag, I ran into a couple <laughs> I, I know from ACC, uh, who are from Canmore. We had no, no idea they were in Kalimnos at the time, but I think they go there every, uh, every two years. So it's it a great running into them uh, halfway around the world. Here we are halfway up uh, wild country, a nine pitch 510B sport climb on the island of Talendos. Hopping out on the climb, Kalimnos is in the background. Talendos uh, can be seen here from inside the Grand Grot Craig on Kalimnos. So Talendos is a, even a smaller island than Kalimnos, and you have to take a, a boat there, and there's no roads, uh, no motorized vehicles allowed on Talendos. So that day we did the multi-pitch rock climb, we actually end up almost circumnavigating the whole island by foot because uh, we did the approach, did the climb, topped out on the island, and then the descent was like down the backside. And then we had to hike uh, back around to where we caught our boat and return to Kalimnos. That was a, quite an adventure. Never stop exploring. Carmen doing a leg bar between uh, two fuss. Monica being lowered off limestone. Yeah, it's uh, hard to believe, but this is limestone rock, which is uh, way different than Rocky's limestone. Climbing until sunset, pretty much every day. Uh, we hiked to the crags every day that week, except for one day when we rented a car to check out the city of Pathia. and checked out a crag called the palace. Our rope gun, Brian, demonstrating the dropped knee. Uh, stalactites on the most overhanging route we climbed. Big holds require big moves. And life is good. Well, that concludes my whirlwind tour of seven mountain adventures around the world. I'd like to thank these people for contributing photos to this presentation and your attention during it.
I can take your, your questions now. Great. Thank you, Sean. That's amazing. Amazing adventures and um, really great pictures. Okay. Um, I guess anybody with any questions, please send them through the chat and I can just read them and then um, John can answer any questions that you may have. Um, what will be your next adventure? Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> hopefully it'll be next year of uh, the pandemic and uh, end this year. Um, in, in the fall or hopefully this fall or winter, um, some friends and I from Calgary would like to go to Spain for rock climbing. We had booked our, three of us from Calgary had booked our flights from Calgary to Spain last April. Uh, we have a couple friends there from Calgary but have been living in Spain. So we were gonna visit them last April to rock climb, but we had to cancel that trip because of COVID. So hopefully we can do uh, a trip in the fall. Um, then next year, I would really like to go to uh, Chamonix for some uh, alpine rock climbing and uh, to climb Mount, Mont Blanc. Mm -hmm. Wait, Wayne has a question. Have you climbed in China? Uh, no, uh, I know, I thought Wayne or uh, I thought a BCMC group did go to China last year or something but um, I haven't climbed in China. Um, closest I came was, did a couple of days of climbing in Thailand, like a, a day of deep water solo, but in China itself, I did not climb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my comment being, I saw the limestone that you were, uh, you were climbing and it is, you're right, it's so different than what we have here. And the stuff in China, in Yangshu, where we were, is very similar, massive, I call them bowling ball holes where you put your hand right in it. Yeah. You can do these huge yeah, moves. So, yeah. So is it also limestone there, Wayne? Do you know? Yes, it is. It's a limestone karst. So it's those columns that rise straight yeah. up. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. So the rock you saw in Kalimnos there, that's similar to the rock in Thailand as well. It's limestone, but like you said, it's totally different from a uh, limestone in Canada. It's like colorful and you have the stalactites. And uh, tufas, which are like the vertical tubes, which uh, totally pumped out my arms because we don't have those features here in Canada. So I wasn't used to those type of holds. Are you saying Canada isn't colorful? <laughs> Canada is very colorful. I, that, that's, that's why even though I've traveled the world, I, I still want to live here. Right. Uh, I'm saying the limestone we have in the Canadian Rockies is not as colorful. Well, maybe Definitely. Vancouver in November is not very colorful. It's pretty gray. But... <laughs> <laughs> yep, that I know. Great. Um, we have a question from Ayrton. I was just wondering, out of the trips you presented, which one was the most challenging and why? Okay, yeah, um, good question. Yeah, of those trips, I would say my the 2004 trip for the trekking to Mount Everest Advanced Base Camp. Um, so that was in 2004, several reasons. One, uh, I had never, that's my first time at high altitude. So say above 3,000, 3,500 meters. So I was unprepared for that. Um, I didn't know, I didn't research it much. It was uh, fully guided, but I didn't research much. So I didn't know anything about high altitude sickness or that I should have brought uh, Diamox, which in my other hikers in the group did, which is a, a medicine that helps you acclimatize quicker, but you, you're supposed to take it before you reach altitude. So I had to uh, snag some uh, Diamox off uh, some of the other hikers. And yes, it was just amazing. I, I, I thought I was in good shape and we were all in good shape. But as soon as we went, say, above 5,000 meters, it was, it was really hard just to hike on like level ground. Um, I was the only one in our group of five during that trek that kept my appetite. Uh, so like after getting food poisoning in Tibet, um, but during the actual trek, I, I was able to eat every day, every meal. Uh, most of the other people uh, kind of stopped eating because they just couldn't keep food down. And we were getting little, the, the expression where you get, um, you're so high up, you get, you're in the nosebleeds. 
Well, we experienced that. Um, when we slept in the tents in the morning, quite often our noses would be filled with like a solid bloody snot, right? Just because we were sleeping it so high up. So yeah, that was the most challenging uh, for sure. And uh, I've since uh, come to appreciate that you need to be uh, better prepared for altitude, even if you're just hiking. That in the inability to eat and feeling nauseated may have nothing to do with the altitude. Okay. Really? A <laughs> uh, question from Paulina. Did you do the W trek when you were in Patagonia as part of your tour? Uh, no, because I don't know what the W track is. Um, <laughs> I haven't heard of that. Uh... Okay. Um, question How can I do a trip like yours in Patagonia? Uh, so, pretty easy. Like, especially now with the internet, like, if you, um, most of my trips, uh, besides like the rock climbing trips, which, uh, I'm comfortable with organizing myself or with friends. The other trips, I went on small group adventure tours. Um, so that's the best way just uh, logistics wise. And since I'm always limited with uh, vacation days from work, I want to get from point A to B to C to more quickly. So I book a, a small group adventure tour and uh, there's just so many tour companies uh, available and with the the internet, it's so much easier now than it was like 10 to 15 years ago when uh, I was doing a lot of my travels. Of course, the internet existed back then, but it's just not as uh, ubiquitous as it is today. So yeah, just do a Google search on the Patagonia adventure tour and you'll get so many companies and just read their reviews, especially uh, reviews from people, say, from Canada, because they'll they'll have a share similar perspectives because we're used to a certain level of uh, comfort or services. Um, so you may uh, get better advice from them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, from Wayne again, would you recommend your Mount Pili route or prefer an alternative? The Kilimanjaro. Oh, okay. Um, Kilimanjaro. Okay, yeah. So we so I did the Machimi route, which is, uh, they call it the whiskey route. It's supposedly, when I researched it at the time, it said it is the most scenic. There, there's one route that's uh, as popular, but it's easier. Um, I forget the official name of it, but the nickname is the Coca-Cola route. <laughs> um, so like I did the whiskey route and the easier route is called the Coca-Cola route. Um, well, I'd much rather be drinking whiskey than Coca-Cola, but I, I've heard that you can go up one way and come down another, almost like a, a traverse as opposed to, did you, did, sorry, my question would be, did you return the same way you went up? You know, Wayne, that's a good question, and my memory fails me. <laughs> it must have been the altitude, and I guess it was the whiskey. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and the co cocoa leaves that they kept telling us to, to eat. <laughs> Uh, no, that's South America. <laughs> See, there you go. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Um, any other questions for John? That's great. It's amazing. Thank you so much for joining us, John. All right. Um, um, yeah, okay. One last thing I'd just like to say. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, I'd say uh, let's all do our part to end this pandemic sooner rather than later so that we can all get back to traveling and enjoying the mountains. Thank you. Totally agree. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, and I guess thank you all for coming to the social this April, um, today. So before we sign off, just a reminder of the May socials on May 11th. Stephen Hoy, author of The 105 Hikes, will be presenting his new book and highlight some of the interesting hikes. So I hope um, all of you will be able to join us next month. And until then, stay safe. Um, and I guess within BC is basically stay within your, your area um, and don't venture out. And just, yeah, as, as Sean was saying, let's, let's uh, fight this virus so that we can get back into traveling and, and adventures.
There's just one thing I'd like to add, uh, since I can't seem to figure out how to go through Kathleen, is that uh, the W route is on the Chilean side, and it involves going up and down two valleys, so hence the name W route. And I've been to both sides, and I would actually prefer to be on the Argentinian side because El Chaltan is just a great little town to be in. This Sean probably a vouch for, just a great place. On the Chilean side, it's a little bit more difficult because the closest hotels to the trailheads, the cheapest one is around 800 a night. <clears throat> if you wish to do that, going up to 2,000 a night. So everyone hence stays in uh, the, a small little town that you have about two hours away from the first trailhead. So it's a whole different experience. So if you ever had the choice to go to only one of the two, I would certainly choose the Argentinian side rather than the Chilean side. Although there's nothing wrong with the chili, it's beautiful, but uh, it's that two hour drive each way in a panic trying to get up the uh, and, and back on the trails, unless you're doing the full W route. So just uh, an interesting comment. Thanks a lot. Great. Okay, thanks Rick for, for the comments. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks again, everyone. Um, have a good evening and thank you, Sean. And Hope you can join us again in the next couple of years and show us some of your other adventures, the adventures that you'll be doing in the next few years. 